The NZXT H210i, clearly it's a fancy looking case with a fancy price tag and fancy features to boot, but I don't much fancy the look of that front panel, seems a little too exclusive for my liking, and not the fancy version of exclusive. We'll check on that in the highly detailed testing section, a lot of work went into that so I hope you like it. So without further ado, let's get back to the beginning and unbox this thing. Chapters throughout by the way, so skip away at your leisure. Hey, check that out. Look at that thing go, it's so cute doing this little click. The unboxing process of the H210i is the same as most cases. It's bookended by some polystyrene molds and bags to keep it scratch free. Visually at heart, this is a minimalist case with a completely sealed perforation free front panel, a glass main side panel, also known as a window, and a solid offside panel. That's not to say it's featureless, but it does its best to hide the clutter. Some clutter is on show, however, such as the intake up top. It looks like NZXT decided to go for the contrasting approach to merging this in, since it's pretty tough to hide a feature like this, and white painted screws probably wouldn't stand the test of time. The side intakes of the front also follow this contrasting aesthetic, being jet black and are also angled, possibly to reflect the light differently to the side panels and increase the contrast with the adjacent panels. Yes, I am clutching straws on that one. No case would be complete without a logo, apparently, so we've got the NZXT logo to the lower section of the front panel in a lighter shade of white than the panel, with a satin finish to further differentiate it. To the rear we have a very typical case layout, lower power supply unit section, central PCI Express slot section, and a 120mm exhaust next to the motherboard rear IO position up top. The front IO exists on top with a power button, USB 3.0 Type-A port, USB 3.1 Type-C port, and a mic and headphone combo 3.5mm jack. No reset button in sight, so if you plan on building a very crash prone system, or regularly overclock your system, then maybe you'll want to consider something else. And rounding off the exterior is the base. We've got some fairly sizable rubber padded feet which are nice and grippy and a pile of slots for a pump, a D5 or DEC, and drive mounting, and a rear power supply unit intake filter, which is actually against the desk actually, I really didn't think about this much before. Really hard to get off. It's perfectly functional for the once in a month clean off, if that, but can catch if you're not paying any attention and I can't get the thing off in this state. But that's not let's not overstate that, it's good enough. Actually really hard to get out when it's just sat on the desk. Okay to put back in though I guess. Getting inside this thing Brace yourself, I could be talking to you or the case, really. Let me explain. This is going to wind up someone, probably, maybe a few of you, but I think it's worth being open-minded about since it could be a deal breaker to someone and they should know this. Maybe someone who hasn't got great dexterity. Okay, I'm building this up too much now. So, to get the glass side panel off, there's a top captive thumb screw that's partly enclosed by a metal tab. It's a bad start since captive thumb screws are awkward enough without partly enclosing them to make accessing them with your thumbs more awkward. It's kind of like the Pisa Express slot ones. Anyway, I don't know where this hard on for captive thumb screws came from, but surely the drugs have to wear off soon so we can get back to normality. Once you've sorted that mess out, I propose a screwdriver is used, you get the pleasure of trying to separate the panel from the chassis. Now this gets messy, so brace to cringe. I didn't know anything about this case coming into this review, as I do with all cases, so this was me trying to figure out how to remove it for the first time, with only the hint of removing it being the metal tab by the thumb screw. No matter which way I tried to pull the tab, nothing was budging, there was no sign of any movement, so I had to resort to just adding more force in each direction to figure out which way it could be removed. So right on the two minute mark, yeah, there was so little feedback that it was gonna move that I didn't expect it to actually move, and when it started moving, well, that small tab wasn't really enough to stop it in time. There's more to this than an overly heavy ball and socket linkage, but, but seriously, when it's strong enough to lift the case off the desk, it's safe to say it could be dialed back a bit. Anyway, I could deal with that if there was something local to leverage off, but there's nothing. Just a small tab to pull on, all by itself with a really heavy retention mechanism. Alright, that's enough about bashing the case for a side panel removal system. It's probably just a one-off and I'll probably only get complaints about me not being strong enough or the case being perfect and I'm just nitpicking. Yeah, this is uh, foreshadowing. 
The front panel, oh no, oh, oh the front panel. At least I can see from the inside what mechanism is holding this one on and it is familiar to me. Now, I don't see myself as particularly spiritual or religious and I can't quite remember if this was a moment of prayer, but anything to prevent this flying through my window due to the panel flying off uncontrollably or me throwing it out myself seemed reasonable. And would you look at that, it worked. It would have been cooler if it was the first time. After I don't know how many reviews of cases with this style of panel retention, this is by far the worst implementation of it, which is madness considering the price of it. Christ, even the O11 Dynamic Mini is cheaper than this thing. Thankfully, the steel side panel is more sensible with openly accessible captive thumb screws and a standard hook on front edge, which is exactly, it's gonna be quick, exactly the way I like to see it. Didn't sound very good. So now we're finally into this thing. It took long enough. Don't be surprised when NZXT are commissioned to develop doors for Alcatraz version 2 or whatever the next version of that is. Let's talk cooling configurations. I've got into the habit, more accurately forced myself to get into the habit, of making compatibility slides to make this stuff just clearer. So, if you're planning to build in this case, for radiators you can go for up to a 240mm up front and a 120mm in the rear, so there's not a huge amount of scope. If you go for a 3.5 inch drive then you're limiting yourself at best to a thin 30mm radiator and a fan, or up to a 60mm and a fan without that drive. Regarding fans, you've got space for up to a couple of 140 or 120 millimeter fans to the front and a 120 millimeter fan position to the top and rear of the case both of which are occupied by black 3 pin 120 millimeter NZXT fans and whether it was for stylistic reasons or performance reasons the top 120 millimeter fan position isn't filtered where you typically see a filter to prevent dust settling into your system when it's switched off speaking of filters we've covered the base power supply unit filter but the front intake is filtered too and thankfully it's filtered at the chassis point rather than at the side intakes. This allows the intake area of the sides to be maintained through to the opening of the chassis rather than reducing the already limited intake area. It clips into the front fan bracket and while it's a little awkward to remove since the clips have very tight tolerances and top tip remove from the pull from the top or bottom since if you pull from the side the two side clips re-engage, you have to re-pop them open and try and yank the thing off then, so anyway, that's that. It's good enough for the occasional clean out, but let's just say you won't feel hard done by after getting through uh, the front panel. That fan bracket though, I say fan bracket, it's really more of a radiator bracket since there's no real need to remove it to install fans. That, that's just overkill and just frankly more work, but for radiators, yeah, not a bad addition, pretty good. A significant uplift in the cost of this unit comes in the form of the ARGB lighting and fan controller. We'll cover the ARGB nature of this a little later, but on the fan side of this individually £25, probably $25 unit, but I couldn't confirm a US price, you can control up to 30 watts of fans across the three PWM headers, which is apparently equivalent to 50 Noctua NF-F12s, the test fans I use, so you can fan split the crap out of this thing for well, the four fan positions available on the case, but you can rest easy knowing you won't overload this thing easily. I'm not going to go into all the details about how the unit controls fans and lighting. NZXT can't seem to make their mind up about how CAM should work, CAM being their fan and lighting controller software that you need to install to control the fans and lighting through this unit. For instance, I prefer the old version of CAM 3 since the later versions ripped out the style of refined fan speed control that I find beneficial. The general idea is you can control fan speed and lighting elements individually with different settings, we'll cover those later on. When when it works it's really solid but it can be finicky so if you find you're having problems I'd get in touch with NZXT to see if they can get a replacement unit sent out to you or figure out some of the teething issues with the software. You've got space in this unit for pretty much any CPU cooler you want with 166mm of CPU cooler clearance. I've got the Side Mugen 5 in here which is 155mm tall and really not that deep compared to many other larger coolers around but even this thing is just 7mm from the tip of the rear fan so if you go for a thicker CPU cooler or a deeper one you might need to factor moving that rear fan elsewhere. 
A couple of last points on water cooling. There is mounting support in the basement for pumps and the draping metal thing has a slot in the center to mount a reservoir to with one of the many brackets you can purchase from pretty much anywhere. Onto the power supply unit compatibility. It's hard to get too irritated by what I'm about to present since you get options and more options is more better. The option I'm referring to is the ATX2 SFX adapter panel, which means they're hinting at SFX power supply units being suitable for this case, which is great since you might already have an SFX system that you want to throw into a new case and selling an SFX power supply unit to buy an ATX one could be a waste of time and money. Great, I'll just throw in an SFX power supply in it, wrap the cables around, CPU up top, graphics card through the basement shroud, motherboard 24 pin through the basement? That that 24 pin cable is looking a little tight. These SFX power supply in it cables sure are short. Let's add the motherboard and, oh, uh, the motherboard 24 pin cable doesn't fit. So we're left with a few choices, buy an extender for the 24 pin connector, buy a longer 24 pin cable overall, buy a power supply unit with longer 24 pin cable in the first place, or swap the SFX power supply unit for a full fat ATX power supply unit. Yep, that, that one sounds easier. And that's a decision you'll have to make for yourself. Already have an SFX power supply unit? You'll probably need an extension cable or a longer 24 pin cable. Buying new? There's no real good reason, apart from um, some check the testing section, to go for an SFX power supply unit for this case. They're more expensive and a little more awkward for this case in particular. In terms of clearance, I've got a lovely compatibility slide for your main components, but how long your power supply unit can be is dependent on your drive choices, so let's cover that next. This is where I think this case veers off onto another level of... Yeah, why? So your drive options on paper look like this. One three and a half inch drive and a few two and a half inch drives or four two and a half inch drives. What's so strange about that? Well, that single three and a half inch drive gets fixed to the bottom of the case where you typically see a drive cage that could take two drives maybe even three at a push, but that's pretty rare. You just get this option for one three and a half inch drive, a two and a half inch drive, or a pump unit if you want. That leaves a load of space above that drive, which is great for cable management, but just overkill. In most scenarios, it's dead space that could be or more efficiently allocated or just removed. Or by removed, I mean designed out of the case just to clarify. Anyway, depending on where you position a three and a half inch drive will dictate radiator thickness and power supply unit depth. Moving away from three and a half inch drives, you've got an abundance of two and a half inch drive compatibility. And I don't appreciate sometimes how damn space efficient two and a half inch drives are. You can put these things just about anywhere. For instance, to the rear of the motherboard tray, we've got a couple of two and a half inch drives, drive positions that are mounted to a drive bracket. There's not much more to say there. It's very standard on cases these days and works very well. But we've also got a two and a half inch drive plastic bracket that clips onto the other side of the basement shroud in the main compartment. It's super simple. Just screw a drive onto the bracket and clip it into the shroud. Now, me being me, I couldn't help but get a little curious about where I could place this thing and thought to myself, well, d d just to the left seems possible, which was preceded with about five minutes of fishing the damn thing out. So while there is a hole in the bottom left, which is not the same as the other ones, where you could place one of those barbed posts for this little bracket thing, if you want to remove it, you'll need to move the power supply unit out of the way. But that's beside the point, since you won't want your power and data cables trailing across the front of the basement shroud on show so the intended position works best as it sits right next to the hit and miss drape draping well, white steel thing uh, that provides an opening to the basement compartment. Motherboard support for this case is limited to ITX boards. There's not much more to say to be honest, ITX boards. Graphics card wise, the install is about as average as can be. The rear plate is a little fiddly, but it's a one time thing, so I can live with that. You've got plenty of space for pretty much any card you want with just shy of 290mm of length clearance and nearly 170mm of width clearance or height clearance, manufacturers regard that bit as height. And you could push and to squeeze a 50mm thick card in here, but it'll be resting on the basement and if you've got an ATX power supply unit, it'll be mostly blocked off. Not recommended. 
For those of you interested in adding long cards or just heavy cards, ones that will probably sag, NZXT have a really cool and simple feature for you. It's this graphics card stand. You can slide it underneath your card, lightly fixing it to the holes and twist it to raise and lower. This isn't the first implementation of an anti-sag graphics card feature, but it's a really clean and simple version with loads of flexibility thanks to the array of holes in the basement which are traditionally only used for ventilation. A few notes about cable management. Like I mentioned in the drive section, since the basement drive support is limited, there's loads of room for cables to be stored, which helps a lot with cable management. In terms of managing the cables with loops and straps, NZXT have a couple of these plastic channels, one to the center of the case and another to the top. My thoughts on these are similar to my thoughts on piles. They're kind of a pain in the ass to have around, stick out like a sore thumb, and my experience is just it's far better without them not that no yeah oh, okay I mean seriously what are these plastic walls doing that velcro straps by themselves don't allow for they really limit the flexibility of routing cables while not really adding much value the draping metal white thing up front is hiding the sight lines through to the rear compartment so it's not like it's that functional in that respect I mean the walls blocking sight lines maybe I'm just super off base but give me some loops and velcro and I'm just a happy chappy regarding the front IO and its cables you get your standard type C connector 3.0 type A connector and audio connector but you also get a consolidated front IO connector for your power button power LED and drive activity LED so you don't have to fiddle with the tiny headers on the board a solid nice to have feature the standard setup is for Intel boards but you do get this adapter which splits the connections if you want if you're not using an Intel board say or you just don't want to have the connectors for say the LEDs connected to avoid those blinking lights. Speaking of blinking lights, the fan and ARGB lighting controller unit comes with an ARGB lighting strip to the top of the main compartment. Like I mentioned in the cooler configuration section earlier, I'm not going to go over all the control options for this since it'll probably get outdated pretty quick. Simply put, at the moment you've got control down to individual LEDs in static breathing and wave modes, although the wave mode at its slowest is still pretty fast to me, you'll see that now. Now, which is probably due to the controller switching the LED between colors rather than fading from one color to the next but who knows maybe that'll come in a future update you've also got lighting modes that can change the color of the LEDs based on the temperature of your system components your GPU or CPU or the frames per second of the game you're playing which is pretty neat anyway you'll be better off looking for a review of the latest version of cam I know version 4 is pretty new about a month old as of the time of upload which should give you a strong idea of what to expect but I'll add this quickly NZXT are absolutely sh awful at explaining how cam works on their website my theory is they've probably given up on trying since it keeps changing so often apart from that hopefully the shots give you a good idea of what you can get or an idea of what this thing can look like with the included single ARGB strip and whether you'll want to invest in more strips or ARGB fans you've got plenty of headroom to add more strips to this unit as you can daisy chain them together up to 40 LEDs per channel there's two channels so 80 LEDs in total, the included strip containing 10 LEDs. So there's more than enough room for expansion and plenty of clearance for you to slot some extra strips into. Something that's super boring and only important to a few people is the accessories and manual. Accessories wise, in addition to all the screws and some zip ties, I'm still waiting for Velcro straps to be standard. You get that neat graphics card support, a headphone and mic combo splitter and the front IO splitter or adapter. The manual is, well, it's okay. It's similar to reading a broadsheet newspaper, and by similar I mean it's actually bigger in both width and length. The standard text can be referred to as small print throughout, and checking out the online version is, oh come on. Bottom line, the diagrams are so small the detail nearly gets lost, and there's too much text and or it's just too small. It's just eye straining, if not headache inducing. It needs a lot of work to be regarded as okay or be good. 
Now for what matters, the performance. Well, the other half of what matters. The rest is just as important. Since this is the return of ITX reviews on the channel, I needed something to compare to. So in addition to the test bench, without any case fans, I tested the O11 Dynamic Mini in its three-slot ITX configuration with several setups to find the optimal cooling layout. As for the H210i, in its default configuration, we've got two fans in a rear exhaust and top exhaust configuration, very much a negative negative pressure setup. With all the case fans running at full speed to identify this case's maximum stock performance, the Primal T5 and Fermark testing shows the CPU for thermal performance is fairly strong in the H210i. Well, compared to the O11 Dynamic Mini, which had no case fans, the H210i should perform better, but it's really not that far off the pace of the open-air test bench with the same cooling setup minus the case fans. I've included other open-air test bench setups with different CPU coolers, such as the NHU9S, which is a smaller cooler than the uh, Mugen 5 that's in the O11 Dynamic Mini and the H210i. With the lower CPU load through Firestrike, we've got essentially the same performance difference as seen with the Priority 5 and Fermark pre previous testing, which makes me more eager to drop one or the other. GPU thermal performance in the H210i stock setup isn't so good, however, and that's not surprising considering there's not much encouraging airflow towards the graphics card's cooler's intake. There's only fans drawing air away from the CPU cooler area. The H210i is closer to the performance of the open air test bench than the non fando 11 Dynamic Mini, but the drop in clock speed and increase in thermals need to be taken into account. The lowest results might seem confusing since they look like they're cooler than the results higher up in the list, but these setups on the open air test bench crashed due to high CPU thermals, so the graphics card didn't have a chance to get any hotter. That was Fermark though, how about Firestrike? Well this shows the H210i is closer in performance to the O11 Dynamic Mini with no fans than the open air test bench. Look at that dropping clock speed to keep the thermals in check. It's not as bad as a case with no fans, but it's quite clear that this setup, running the case fans at full speed, isn't great for the graphics card, but is pretty good for the CPU. Before we move on to changing up the fan setup, it's worth noting some very important points, or VIPs, such as the comparative case sizes, the max fan speeds, the stock fans were running at throughout the stock testing, which was 1400 RPM in the H210i, and the noise level of the system, which was 41 decibels decibels at full speed, which I believe long term isn't very comfortable, so I'd opt for lower fan speeds which would result in higher temperatures or more down clocking, or maybe some different setup. But what if we optimise the setup? Do we get better performance? That may be a bit of foreshadowing there. I think the most intuitive change to make to better optimise this case would be to add some intake fans to the front, so let's do that and see what happens. Now it needs to be prefaced that the testing we're about to look at is noise normalised. So where the last test was setting the fans to max speed to see what the best thermal performance and highest noise output would be, this testing is setting the case fan speeds to emit a certain noise output which is 37.5 dBA at 40 centimetres away from the case at a, 40, at a 45 degree angle from the front of the case and seeing how much the thermal performance differs. So how did the H210i do? Well this might surprise you but where the stock max testing had the CPU at 57.2 degrees at 41 dBA, the H210i with two extra fans at 37.5 dBA is at 37.9 degrees. So the extra two fans basically allowed the fans to slow down and reduce the noise output without much thermal cost. Now I did test the stock setup in the noise normalized testing and it was two degrees hotter on the CPU. So at 15 pounds or oh, $20 per fan for two degrees of thermal improvement, that might not be the most optimal way to improve your thermals cost-wise. Compared to the O11 Dynamic Mini, well, I'd say it does quite well. With only two extra fans, four fans in total, the H210i is about as good as the three extra fan setup in the O11 Dynamic Mini. Switching to Firestrike also switches the order around a little, but the relative results aren't all that different, so let's move on to the GPU thermals. This is where things get weird, but consistently weird, which is the best kind of weird. So, the thermals for the graphics 
card are actually no better by adding the front case fans. So you're basically getting nothing extra for the cost. There's not much more to say there. The graphics card thermals aren't great all round, well below the performance seen in the O11 Dynamic Mini. And it's not like changing over to Firestrike testing changes that. It's well, well below the performance on offer in the O11 Dynamic Mini. Now the question is, why do more fans result in worse performance? Surely the extra intake would benefit the system as a whole. Well, the intuitive answer is the lower fan is just blowing air around, creating turbulence without adding airflow through the case, getting clean air, clean fresh air in and extracting the hot air, just blowing it around. I think there could be a case for saying since the back of the case below and around the PCI Express slot is blocked off, basically sealed, airflow isn't encouraged underneath the graphics card where its intake is. So you could think of it as there being a block of air underneath the graphics card that has to go through the card to get out, kind of. And once it's gone through the card, the airflow from the lower front fan could be trapping the hot air in that lower zone of the case, which then recycles the air through the card. You might find better results with an SFX power supply unit since the grill below the card would be open to allow air up into the, into the card, providing some momentum towards the higher exhaust, but that's just speculation on my part. Very important points for this testing, the H210i fans were spinning at 50% speed, and that didn't need to change when adding the extra fans. The NF F12s, Noctua fans, were quiet enough to not add to the noise output running with the stock fans. So overall, the H210i is good for CPU performance and not great for graphics card performance, actually pretty bad. It would appear that the panel work around the graphics card could do with some attention. I'm quite pleasantly surprised by the CPU thermals throughout the testing though. Some really solid performance despite the meager looking intake area around the front side intake. So let's get into a conclusion. Starting with the price, we've got the cost of the cases with and without additional fans in the different configurations in pounds, dollars and euros. You'll probably notice the cost of the O11 Dynamic Mini and H210i are really close and the main difference depends on the price on location and whether you have that third fan in the O11 Dynamic Mini or no fans in the H210i. Notice that all of the O11 Dynamic Mini prices all have fans added on top since it doesn't come with case fans, whereas the H210i comes with fans so is on a good position to be better value. Price isn't in a bubble though, so let's mash it with the performance found in the noise normalized testing. Now, I've thought a long and hard about how to present these figures, since price versus performance for the GPU side of things won't work. It's the downclocking that makes the main dif is the main differentiator here. So for the CPU performance value, we've got price versus thermal performance, and for the graphics card performance value, we've got price versus the limited 400 megahertz range of the clock speed that we've looked at on the graphs. Others may find this wrong but realistically we're not going to have the graphics card drop to zero megahertz so some kind of limit is required here and the thermals as we said just wouldn't work. Anyway that's the understanding of what we're about to run through so for the USA for the CPU side of things as expected the stock H210i is the best value and that's no surprise since it was a great performer without any extra fans and is the cheapest on the board since it doesn't require any extra fans. But for the lower loads like Firestrike, you can actually buy the O11 Dynamic Mini with fans and get better value to the H210i in terms of GPU performance. Now, in the UK, the H210i is more expensive than the O11 Dynamic Mini, so depending on the load, the Priority 5 and Furmark or Firestrike, again, you can actually get better value with the O11 Dynamic Mini with extra fans, at least regarding GPU performance. And for the EU, well, it's basically the same as the others. This case performs really well outside of the GPU thermal issues. If they could have solved that issue, this would be a case to recommend for any purpose, relatively speaking. So what can I recommend this case for? Well, I can't recommend it for those of you who want a high performance, purely air-cooled system. I think the graphics card area is woefully underdeveloped, and if you're throwing in a hot GPU, expect it to stay hot and pay the price with some frames or the cost of another card to factor in some failure in the future. I'm kind of joking there, but, but just keep in mind that high temperatures does affect the lifespan of components. If you're water cooling though, you can avoid those issues entirely, so yeah, why not give it a go? If you're a data hoarder, the lack of a drive cage for a couple of 3.5 inch drives is off-putting. 
Sure, it might be fine to begin with, but if you're anything like me, I've got an M.2, two two and a half inch drives, and a six terabyte hard disk drive, and I'm looking to throw another three and a half inch hard disk drive, and maybe another two and a half inch drive in. So if I use this case, I'd need to think about getting a really high capacity single three and a half inch drive to consolidate a lot of my data and make do with a number of smaller capacity two and a half inch drives. Perhaps something for you to think about depending on how much storage you think you'll need in the future since there's a limited scope to just throw in another drive. Spoken like a true politician, what is it actually for? Well, lower power air-cooled GPUs, mid-power water-cooled systems, and low capacity storage systems as long as you don't want to regularly open the system for tinkering. I just think removing those panels are a pain in the ass to regularly use and they're okay despite okay okay despite their sort of jarring opening for very occasional access or if you don't care about any of that and just like how it looks which is why this is destined to be Amy's desktop PC with a 980 Ti yeah I, I, anyway, I hope you found that useful. It was quite a long one, but that should leave no stone unturned minus cam, which is a constantly changing tide of confusion. If you like what you see and wanted to pick one up, or pick up an H210i, I've got some Amazon associate links in the video description. Give them a click to find the H210i in your region, and it can support this channel if you buy anything through them. If you want to really help me out, get subscribed, leave a like, and share the video around. I recommend throwing on Twitter and Facebook and tagging in NZXT on it. Maybe they'll take some notice of the channel, and I can get my hands on some of the latest stuff when it comes out, and we can cover it in similar detail. Of course, as always, my Patreon, if you just want to support me directly, a big thanks to those of you who are already on there. I create weekly updates, sometimes bi-weekly updates, particularly when things get busy, such as this case review is quite a tough one, uh, that give you behind the scenes access of what's happening on the channel every week, behind the scenes. Thanks for considering all of that, and thanks for checking this one out. I'm one of the small guys on here, so every little helps. Seriously, it means a lot. So thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next one.